we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We really do. And we're beginning a season here where we're going to be talking about thanksgiving unto the Lord. And uh, the great thing about teaching through books of the Bible, the Lord plans out what you get to speak on. And uh, really over the next, I would say, month, month and a half, we'll be talking about how we honor the Lord through the things that he's given us. So uh, I don't plan it, I just go through it and hopefully you understand it when I'm done. Uh, we are in part 7, this is our final part of this series of Joyous Living in Luke chapter 15. And we're just going to read this final portion of the prodigal son, or at least that's how we've known the story throughout the ages. Hopefully today I'm going to change your mind a little bit. You're going to see it in a different light. Maybe in a way that you've never looked at it before. Now, we've talked about the youngest son, and we've talked about the father, and now we're getting into the oldest son today. Starting in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Lord, it is a supreme honor uh, just to be able to open these words that you pass through the mouths of prophets that you use Gentiles and doctors to instruct us in today. Father, even men that thought that they were of no reputation that really were, Lord, you inspired your word through them. And today as we look at this, I pray that we have an understanding Father, I pray that every single one of us identifies with one of the sons because we are one of them somewhere or possibly in between. Holy Spirit, I ask for your empowerment in my life and my preaching and in the lives of your saints, of your Christians that are in this room today, that they might hear your word and understand it and impart it to other people. And if there are those that don't know you, Father, I ask that you draw them into that saving relationship today. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 17.10 is our congregational verse. Luke 17.10, if you wouldn't mind saying that with me. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. The great pastor, teacher, minister, evangelist, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody once visited a prison called the Tombs. Pretty hard place to be from what I've read. As he got there, he went and shared the gospel. He got to preach to all the inmates that were there during that time. Now, after it was over, he went up to many of them that were still in their cells, and he asked them this question. He said, what brought you here? What brought you here? Pretty good way. I I would bet being a pastor and being the intellect that this guy was, he had thought about how he was going to approach these guys after he had finished preaching. Well, he asked them the question, what brought you here? And he received a litany of responses, one of which is, I don't deserve to be here. I was framed, I was falsely accused, I was set up, and the trial that I went through was unfair. 
jail cell after jail cell he entered into and got the same response time and time again until he came upon a man who had his face buried in his uh, hands and he was weeping profusely. As he came up to the man, he said, My friend, what in the world is so wrong with you? And he said this, he said, My sins are more than I can bear. And with that, he knew that he had found somebody that he needed to direct toward Jesus Christ. Right then and there, he shared the gospel with this man for he had seen his sins for what they really were. There can be no doubt that there's no greater joy than sharing Jesus with the lost people around us. That's what we're about, church. That's why we're here. That's why you're sitting in these pews today. That's why I'm standing here and I've got these guys playing these instruments behind me or singing out through the choir. It's because we're here to honor Christ. That's it. We come in here to worship Him. We come in here to learn about Him. And when we do that, we find great joy in doing it. Do you live a life of joy to the Lord? And if not, why is that? I believe it is very clear within the Scriptures that you can. As we continue today, I want to remind you what chapter 15 is all about. In it, Jesus gives us three parables that help us to understand where true joy is found in this life. This morning we're going to finish this third point, which I know has been going and going and going, but really the point has never changed, and that's what I needed you to get. Jesus joyfully lives to find a son. Had it been just for one son, if God needed to step out of heaven and come to earth for one son, for one daughter, he would have done it. And that's the beauty of what we're talking about. He's seeking out that lost son. He's coming into a place that's hostile against them in order that they might know him. As we investigate this final section in the parable, I want to point something out that's commonly overlooked. I would bet that the majority of us grew up hearing the story as it's entitled The Prodigal Son. And I've referred to it as that, as I've been preaching through this. I think that by now, you've been able to tell that this story is about more than just the prodigal. It's about more than the wasteful son that went and basically threw away his portion of the inheritance. It's really about more than him, and it's, it's about the father and then it's also about the eldest son. It's about all three. We spent at least one-third of this talking about the youngest son. We spent a portion of it talking about the father, and we're going to spend the last third actually talking about the eldest son. Now, this is where Jesus is addressing the critics, and here's what I think that we've probably missed. This is the point here. When Jesus gets to this last section, what he's talking about, what he's describing in this story, actually is a result of what was asked originally. He's addressing his critics in this last portion. He's doing what hasn't been done up until this point. Yes, he told a story and he included the son that we get caught up and captivated by, and yes, he was talking about the Father, but when he's in this section, this is why Jesus, this is what the people needed to hear. This is what they needed to hear about. He's actually directly answering their question in this final section. All the parables that we've seen in chapter 15 were spawned from Disdain. If you remember, the parable of the sheep had come out because Jesus is talking to the tax collectors and sinners. The religious leaders look at him and they're like, what are you doing? Why are you hanging out with them? So he gives that parable. The parable of the sheep, there was a sheep that was out there and didn't care that it was lost. It was fine to be eating the grasses by itself or ultimately die as long as it was getting what it needed. It didn't care. It represented those tax collectors and sinners, those people who did not care. By the time you get to the second one, the parable of the coin, that represents the religious leaders. 
the religious leaders. And the big word that we tack on to there, the one that you need to keep in mind, is they didn't know. They didn't know that they were lost. They thought that they were the ones that were going to bring about salvation. They thought that they were going to be able to teach the rest of the population what it took, the rest of the Jews around them, to understand who the Messiah was when they didn't know themselves. And now we're in this last one. And in this last one, we're actually talking about the oldest son. Now the oldest son, again, represents the religious leaders. The youngest son had represented the tax collectors and the sinners. So the eldest son is representing the religious leaders, the religious leaders, the people that thought that they had everything under control, the ones that had made up so many rules for people to live by that they couldn't live by them themselves, yet they continued to pretend. Now, why did Jesus tell all of these stories? Why was he going through all this? Because he wanted the religious leaders to understand that by sharing with the lost, by sharing with the people that were willing to listen, he found great joy in doing that. The positive side of reaching the lost is entering into joy. I don't know if you've ever done it before, if you've ever actually walked through and shared the gospel bit by bit with people. And then somebody responded. They were broken in their sin. They, they saw who they were in need of a Savior. And they turned to Christ. And you happen to be present in that magnificent moment to see what's going on. I mean, it's awesome. It, it, is, it is the best thing in the world to be a part of that. That's the positive side. That's what we see the youngest son going through. That's what he went through with his father. But there's also... A negative side when we share the gospel, isn't there? Is there going to be people who are going to reject the things that we say? They're not going to believe what we have to say about who Jesus is, what he offers. And that's what's being represented here in this son. This eldest son is rejecting his father. What he's doing is rejecting the gospel. He's rejecting that offer of grace that his father was providing. Even though Jesus joyfully lives to find a son, many are unaware of that necessity. Sometimes he finds the ignorant. He doesn't always find the repentant. He'll find the ignorant. We see that played out in verses 25 through 27 where it says, Now the older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has gone about and he's killed the fatted calf. To the religious elite, the older son is the hero of the story. I've even heard that in churches. I've seen it where people describe that in commentaries that the oldest son is the hero in the story. In this passage, we see that he was out in the field, most likely watching over some of the hired servants that we had talked about, those day laborers. He never left his post. From the beginning, it seems like he's doing what the father wants, but truthfully, he was just going through the motions. All he's doing is pretending. For whatever reason, the son left the field and headed for the house. And as he drew near, he heard music and dancing. And I want to point something out that is often overlooked here by some denominations, which I'll leave out of it. One of the things that we will hear a lot of times from denominations, even within our circles right here in Hinesville, is that when we gather for worship, We should sing because music is represented and commanded within Scripture. But what we don't want to do is have these guys. Not the choir. They're allowed to do it. They can sing acapoco if they want to. But right here behind me, we're not allowed to have instrumentation. And here's why. They live by what's known as the regulative principle. You know you're getting a lesson this morning, but a regulative principle. And here's what it means in this 
invades Baptist life a lot of time. I'm trying to set up the wall of defense before it happens to us, which I don't think this one's coming in, but you never know. They live by the regulative principle which states, if you don't see it in Scripture, if it's not directly commanded, then you can't do it. And we're commanded to sing unto the Lord. That's very clear in Scripture. But there's never a command that we have instrumentation. Therefore, if it's not given in a worship setting, we cannot have instruments. Now you say, well, the Old Testament, well, they deal with the Old Testament differently than they do the New Testament. They say this is the new covenant, new rules, and here's what we're living by. We're just going to do exactly what the Word of God tells us to do. Now our knee-jerk reaction to that is, right, we're going to do what the Word of God tells us to do. That is until you go and flesh that out completely. We're going to follow the Word of God, but we're not going to unnecessarily restrict ourselves either. I'll give you an example of this. Ladies, if you're in here today, you've got a pantsuit on, we've got a problem. Because Scripture never says that you can wear a pantsuit. Now, it does talk about robes, not dresses. We have fundamentalist churches all around us in here. And they say that the ladies have to wear these ankle-length dresses and their hair's up in a bow. You see them in Walmart and it scares you a little bit, but they're all over the place. Now that you're allowed to do. But the funny thing about it is you never see that command exactly given in Scripture like that. They'd have to wear a robe not to violate the principle. But I don't see people walking around in robes. Guys, I never see anywhere in Scripture where it says that it's okay for you to wear glasses while you're worshiping. Contacts, haven't seen that one either. Got your cell phone, you're in big trouble. Because they never wrote about the cell phone in Scripture. I've never seen it. (laughs) There are so many things. It's, they want you to hold on to just what's in Scripture. Now, I'll say this. I believe that these are Bible-believing Christians. I just believe in this area their practice is a little bit off. The Scripture was meant to be a framework that you could take into any setting, and you could sit it down, and it would work. So we take the gospel, and we may go to a tribe somewhere halfway around the world, and we set that framework down, and it works because it's the gospel and it's the power to save. We don't need anything else. We don't need to change the way that they dress. We don't need to change their style of worship. You know, the way that they sound around the world isn't the way that we sound in here this morning, and that's okay because they're here to worship Jesus Christ the same way that we are. Now, here's where we get into real trouble if you start to flesh this out even further. This parable is representing certain things for us. When the son comes back to the father, what would that represent? The youngest son. He's coming in repentance and faith. That's one. Okay, now the father throws a celebration. Now when they get together for the celebration, what would that be considered for us? Worship. It's worship. And what were they doing? I'm sorry, guys. What were they doing when they were there? They were singing and they were dancing. They were singing and they were dancing. The Greek word that's used for singing or music that's used in there for music is symphonia is symphonia. What do you think symphonia sounds like, Samuel? Symphony. Symphonic, exactly. That's the root word. So here's what was happening in this party, and this is why I'm bringing all of this up. In this party, they had people in there with instruments, and they were singing, and they were dancing together. All these things were happening right there at once. So when you hear somebody argue and say, we shouldn't have instruments in worship, that's unbiblical, you say, well, hold on a second. Let's look at the prodigal and see what it has to say about this important subject. 
I don't know how many of you know him, but one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite commentary writers was a guy, he was a Greek scholar by the name of Dr. Kenneth Woost. Dr. Kenneth Woost. Hey, if you're on that back row, hit the kids back there and wake them up. There we go. Praise God they're with us now. All right. Dr. Kenneth Woos was a Greek scholar, and uh, he had this to say in verse 25. I've given it to you. Uh, it's going to be up on the screen this morning. He said this in verse 25. And when coming, he drew near to the house and heard music playing by a number of musicians in concert and the sound of a people dancing in a circular dance on the lawn. Now, Baptist, we won't deal with the dancing this morning. I saw somebody tapping their foot earlier. I wasn't going to say anything. But the reality is, is dancing and playing of instruments and music was a part of worship back then, and it remains one for us today. Not knowing what was going on, the oldest son asked a nearby servant boy. These servant boys would have been waiting out on the perimeter. When a huge party like this went on, they weren't involved with it. They weren't coming in. The parents were in there. They were celebrating together. And these guys were out on the edge. They might have been playing. But a servant boy saw what was happening. The servant boy went on to explain that his brother, the youngest brother, had returned home safe and sound, and the father was throwing a celebration. Uh, a celebration. Not only did the youngest son return in good health, but he had left behind that corrupt lifestyle where he was living like the Gentiles outside of their area. Returning safe and sound is yet another illustration that points to the faith and repentance in this story. Everything that just happened, everything that just took place in that brief second illustrates repentance. It illustrates the love of the Father. It illustrates a celebration that was taking place. Typically, if a celebration was taking place like this, the oldest son would have been the one to plan everything. He would have been the one to get everything together. So he would have known from the get-go what resources were needed, who needed to do what, who needed to be where, and he would send people out to collect these different items. The fact that he was ignorant of this probably indicates that he knew exactly how the father was going to react or how the oldest son was going to react whenever the father came to him. He was ignorant of what was happening all around him. You may not have seen this earlier, but if you go back to verse 12 of this same parable, it says that the father divided their inheritance. The inheritance didn't just go to the youngest son, which is the way we normally read it. The oldest son always had already taken his portion as well. He had received two-thirds of his estate, and he was fine to go out, which is feeding into the fury of of the oldest son during this time because he's looked in and his father who had still maintained control he had commanded Yusufruk to take place and when he did that he said son I know that I've let you take control of this estate and it's going to be all yours one day but I'm going to dip back in and I'm going to get the fatted calf so that we can feed these 200 people this was not a small thing and they didn't have 10 fatted calves sitting in stalls during that day they had one that they fed from birth and they just waited for it to get big enough where they could use it at a huge celebration the son, the eldest son during this time would have been shocked and confused with everything that was going on. We're supposed to draw a parallel at this point in the story. Today, most of the world is ignorant of the grace of God. That was the eldest son. He was ignorant of what was happening inside. He was ignorant of what was going on. He was ignorant of what the father was doing for the youngest son. You know... The world remains ignorant of what God is desiring to give them. Some people in this world today, 
they don't understand what God has in store for them. And it's very sad when you're talking with people and they view earth in a way that has not been tainted with sin. They don't see it as being affected as we do in Romans 8 where all of creation is under the fall and it's moaning and it's groaning. They say this is the best things are going to be and it's never going to get any better from here. So let's just enjoy life to the fullest here and when it's over, it's over. But we know as believers when it's over, it ain't over. They're ignorant of the glory that God has in store for them in the future. There's so much more. Think about what it's going to be like after this earth when we're in the new heavens and the new earth and nothing has been touched by sin. Your pumpkins don't rot at Thanksgiving. Mosquitoes don't attack you. I, you know, I heard somebody say not too long ago that they thought it was our state bird. The way that they do. What we have taking place here with the oldest son is he's angry over what's happened. And listen to this. He's trying to separate the grace that God offers from God himself. You can't do that. You don't have the grace without the God of grace, even though you enjoy a little bit of what he's given in this creation. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus once said this in Matthew 13, 44. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Catch me on this point, folks. There are so many people that are ignorant of what God is offering. Thinking again, thinking again that what they have earned in this life, what they've worked for is going to be enough. And yet they're failing in life. They have things going wrong left and right. Their own flesh betrays them. And yet we know a God and a king who is not only going to fix the flesh, he's going to give us a glorified body, but he's going to give us a perfect state to live in where the kingdom of God is described as joy and peace forever. The world has to be ignorant of that fact. They have to be, because if they understood what God was offering, we would be having to add a balcony. This place would be packed out, because they were getting to hear about the grace and love of God. Sometimes, sometimes when you're out sharing the gospel, you're going to find the ignorant. People that just don't know, they don't understand. Next, I want you to see that Jesus finds the indignant. He finds the indignant. At this point in the parable, a servant must have gone back and reported the outrage that resided in the oldest son's face because we don't have any interaction there. Because verse 28 says, But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Now, if you're taking notes, you're really going to have to concentrate here. The technical term for what's taking place here is temporis tantrium. Temperous tantrum. He was pouting. He was pouting. He did not like to hear what his father was telling him during that point. He refused to go into the party. He was upset because he didn't hear about, he didn't get to plan the party. He was upset because the grass-fed, grain-fed Angus cow was given to his younger brother. He was upset because his disobedient brother was now receiving what belonged solely to him, or at least he thought that. He was beside himself. He was indignant. And yet the father reacted in a way that most of us couldn't stomach because we treat the lost around us like the religious leaders did. Jesus tells us that the father pleaded with his son to come in. Man, I, I, I encourage you. I've already named him today. I encourage you to just buy a Woost. Buy a Woost translation and go back and read. What it's saying here, 
the word encouraged will be translated pleaded or entreated. And the father is begging. He's begging this religious older son, this son who had, by all appearances, done the right thing. He's begging him to come to the party. And the guy's just standing there fuming. He's mad over what's happening. He doesn't want to go in. He sees it. He said, why in the world would this take place? My father's taking my stuff and using it for this derelict. What in the world is he doing? The word pleading there in the Greek actually means to come alongside. So here's the picture. The father's like this. He's like, come on. Just come into the party. Just, just come into the party. I mean, I know you're upset. Just come into the party with me. This is the same word that Jesus had used with his disciples when he was teaching them. He would bring them alongside of him. The noun form of this, parakletos, in the Greek actually is used of the Holy Spirit who helps us and guides us, teaches us which way we should go. So what is that saying about the Holy Spirit? It's saying that the Holy Spirit who has indwelled us is next to us, is with us, and showing us where he wants us to go. That's who we have in God. That's the gracious love that we see in God. A God that loves us and is compassionate enough and sees us in our sin and yet is coming alongside of us saying, Come on, I know that you're doing this. I know that my son doesn't deserve to die on the cross. He did it anyways. Come on, come into the family. And yet so many of us are just rejecting that offer. The father of this story is so gracious which is what Jesus wants the Pharisees and the scribes to understand about him. For almost three years, he had been pleading with them to repent of their sins, but they saw no need in doing that. They, like the leaders of the synagogue in chapter 13, were indignant with him refusing what needed to be done because he would not follow their man-made rules. The oldest son was angry with the father, not because he broke some law, but because he was unwilling to do the things his way. The son's looking at the father saying, why don't you do things my way, the way that I see that they need to be done. He was selfish and prideful, showing great disdain for his father's benevolence. There are so many people in this world, and most likely this room, that are exactly the same way. They seem to desire the salvation that Jesus offers, but are unwilling to come to him on his terms. I want salvation, but not the way that you're offering it. I want to ask you a question. If you had a son or a daughter that showed you that much disrespect, but you knew what they were heading for, wouldn't you still come alongside them and say, come on, come on into the party? Come on, come into glory. Don't you understand what God has in store for you? Don't you see what he has waiting on you? Wouldn't you do everything in your power to bring them in? Wouldn't you beg with them? If you had to, would you get down on your knees and say, please understand what's in store for you. Please see what's going to happen if you die without Jesus Christ. That's what the father in this story is doing. Some people treat grace like it's not needed. They become indignant. They're like, why would you talk to me like this? I've already got everything figured out. I'm living a good moral life. Folks, the people that think that they are living a good moral life are often the hardest ones to reach. They're often the hardest ones to deal with. Right now, if I were to send you out in the community today and say, okay, you go out there and you're going to share with the cults that are around, if you're going to share with the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, you can have a great love for them because you know that they're lost. But when you go to reach them, they are the most difficult ones to reach because they are so indignant about what they believe. When you've been broken as a Christian and you've seen your sin for what it really is, then you just feel sorry for people around you. You see that they're in the same position that you once were in yourself. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 33.11. He said, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure 
in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? God has always sought to save his people, even if it required pleading with them. It's unfortunate that some people are so indignant that they refuse to listen to you, even when you're trying to help them. This is where it starts to get good. At this point in the story, the sewage that pours out of the old son's mouth is unbelievable. Please follow in your passage. Read with me what he says. He says this to his father. Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son, do you hear the disdain for his father? As soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf. Folks, the lies and half-truths contained in those verses are incredible. First, he said that he had been serving his father for many years. He obviously had been serving his father, but he had been doing it for himself. The word that he used for serving there, by the way, means to be a slave, doulos. He said, Dad, I've been slaving for you all of these years. He did it out of obligation, not out of love. Have you ever seen that from people around you? They'll do what you ask, but they're not doing it out of love. But when people love you, it just makes working together so much easier. When we started going through this parable, we saw the hatred of the youngest son for his father. But the great thing about that, which seems odd, is that the son came right out and he said, Dad, give me my inheritance. I hope you're dead. That's basically what he's saying. Whereas you have the maniacal, devious, older son who still doesn't love his father. He hates his father. He has the same disrespect for his father, but he's bottled everything up. He's holding it in. He's just going through the motions, but he doesn't like him anymore. Now, honestly, who would you rather deal with? Folks, if it were me in this situation, I would rather deal with the younger son than the older son. At least the younger son is willing to come out and say, this is what's going on. And that's where Jesus found himself with the tax collectors and the sinners. He's talking to these guys, and the guy's like, yeah, I ripped him off the other day, and this woman over here, I've taken thousands of dollars. That's who he was talking to. The sinners, the drunks, the people were saying, I get drunk all the time, I'm getting high, I'm watching pornography, I'm doing all of these things. At least they were admitting to it. you got to get people to that point, and that's why Jesus was talking to these people. The eldest son was so into himself. He believed that he was morally righteous, which is self-righteousness at its core. The youngest son came right out and let the father know how he felt, but the oldest son had kept everything inside. He had never loved him. That was Jesus' way of pointing out the lack of love that was demonstrated by the religious leaders of their day toward him. They should have been the ones that were counting from the rooftops who Jesus was, the Messiah. Second, he said, <laughs> I never transgressed my father's commandment at any time. Now, church, who does that sound like in Scripture? What story does that sound like? You remember the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler, he's, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the as he said, well, what's the commandments? He goes through them, and he basically says after that, I've kept all the commandments. Well, we know that saying that you have kept the commandments from the beginning is a lie. And what this guy has just done is lied to win an argument. He's lied or he is so self-deceived that he actually sees himself. He said, I've never transgressed anything that you've said my entire life. Now, parents... Come on now. You know it's the truth. 
If you've got kids, you've asked them to do something, and they've gone and done the direct opposite of what it is that you've asked them to do. It happens all the time, and I'll tell you, if your memory is good enough, you've done the same thing. Everybody sins. Everybody's guilty of sin. Every part of our life is touched in some area with sin. Therefore, we have to own that as believers, but this guy wasn't willing to do this. The only one who ever lived a life without failing, without falling, without committing one sin was Jesus Christ. He never transgressed one of his father's commands. He was the only one that really could say that. Third, after the son lied, he excluded his father, listen to this, from his would-be celebration. He wanted a goat so that he could make merry with his friends, but he didn't want his father to have any part of it. Man, if that doesn't sound like the world, I don't know what does. Right now, the greatest thing that is happening on this planet Earth is people enjoying the creation that God has put together. If you go back to the book of Genesis, we see very clearly that he created everything out of nothing and he made it and ultimately he had set it up so that you would glorify him so that everything in creation you take back and say God you gave me this thank you even when we go back to the time of the Old Testament when they're looking at the Sabbath day the people that were there during that day they had two things on that Sabbath day that they were supposed to do number one they were supposed to thank God for all of creation how many of you in these fall changing of colors, have thanked God for what he's doing. Have you ever been sitting in front of a pond or a stream or in the mountains and said, God, thank you for creation, or on the beach, thank you, God, for making the waves in the ocean. You just almost do it automatically. That was one thing that you were commanded to do on the Sabbath. You know what the other one was? Thank you, God, for delivering me from Egypt. It would be us from sin, but thank you, God, for delivering our people. That'd be a pretty good Sabbath, wouldn't it? And this is what he commanded. But folks, right now what's happening in our world is people are looking at creation and they're separating it from the creator. They're, they're not acknowledging the one that provided everything that was given. They're turning away from the provider. And they say, you know what this stuff just is? I want to have my stuff without him. What you start to realize as a Christian is life without Jesus. Things, things, material possessions without Jesus are not worth having. They're not worth having. Why is it that you're going to collect a bunch of trinkets and toys only to leave them when this life is over? You get 60, 70, 80, 90 years, whatever it is on this planet, and then you go on to the next place. You're going on to the next place, and folks, whatever you have here is going to be left behind. And you say, well, we're going to come back. We're going to be here for a little bit, but ultimately the entire universe is going to be destroyed, and God's going to start everything over. So I'm looking forward to what I've stored up on that end of things, not what I have here. Does that just make sense to you? I hope that it does. A biblical mindset leads you to that place. The father had slaughtered the fatted calf because the youngest son had figured out that he wanted to be with his father, whereas the oldest son wanted nothing to do with him. He wanted to go out and spend time by himself with his friends apart from the father. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, folks. If you're in here today and you want to have stuff without having God, then you don't have salvation. They go together hand in hand. Fourth, the oldest son mistakenly based his righteousness, and this is a huge one, on comparison. He compared himself with his younger brother while insisting that he did nothing wrong. He talked about the prodigal lifestyle that his brother lived while dismissing anything he ever did wrong. If you're the person that consistently compares yourself to those around you, instead of Christ, you'll never see your sin for what it really is. And when you see your sin for what it really is, it's a death sentence. That is if you're apart from Christ. 
Sometimes Jesus doesn't find the repentant, but he finds the indignant. Is that you? By describing the older brother, have I described you? Finally, I want you to see that Jesus finds the insatiable in verses 31 and 32. The father attempts to demonstrate kindness one last time. He says, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Being insatiable means that a person has an appetite for something that cannot be satisfied. The father in the story never withheld anything from either sons. He just wanted to enjoy life with them. He told the oldest son that all he had was his, but that just wasn't enough. Therein lies the problem with the religious leaders. They had an insatiable lust for things apart from God. They just couldn't see everything that God had already given them. I want you to think about this. The religious leaders were a part of the Jewish people. There's one people group that has lasted throughout time. It's the Jews. We've had entire what we called races, although it wasn't another race, uh, entire people groups that have died out that we talk about in history books, yet the Jews continue on. God chose the Jews. Do you think that was a gift? Not only did he choose the Jews, he gave them land. He said, I promise you, I'm going to give you land. I'm not only going to give you land, I'm going to give you a promised land. And when you go in, everything's going to be set up right there in front of you. I'm going to give you people. Nobody has been able to knock out the Jews. We had a holocaust where millions of Jews get killed, and yet they're still thriving. And God's bringing them back together as of via the 1948. It has been happening where the Jews have been coming together. That's another gift that God has been giving them. Land, people, and he has blessed them like no other people. I don't like to say it this way, but some of the smartest people I have ever met in my life are what? I can't believe you said that. Um, he not only did that, <laughs> he gave them the scriptures. You say, well, if that wasn't enough, it was through their line that our precious Savior came. And still, what you see happening here is they have an insatiable lust for things apart from the God that wanted to save them. They had been given all of that stuff when he's just saying, I want to be here with you and, in, and us enjoy it together, but they couldn't see that. The selfish, legalistic system that the religious leaders concocted is the direct opposite of what God has offered. Ultimately, God isn't going to provide heaven for us without Jesus. Honestly, that's not even heaven, is it? If you believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we'll share in the kingdom together. The Lord knows that we can't be satisfied with anything eternally apart from him. Maybe you've heard a bunch of preacher words this morning. Okay? Hear what you need to. I want to show you in two passages of scripture, if you believe this to be true, what it is that's going to satisfy you and what won't satisfy you. According to Luke chapter 16, the religious leaders were, and this is right below our passage in the next chapter, they were lovers of money, yet that was never enough for them. They unfortunately didn't believe what Solomon had written in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10, who was a wealthy man. He said this, he who loves money will not be satisfied with what? Do you see it? Will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Money, things, material possessions, it will never satisfy you apart from Christ. You say, well, you've got to put those together to me. I, I see where it's saying money and things aren't going to satisfy me, but what about the rest? But as for true believers, they know who can gratify 
their restless soul. In Psalm 91, it's a famous one, especially for our soldiers. Listen to what it says in 14 through 16. The Lord says, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life. I will, what's it say? This is the Lord speaking. He said, I, I, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Every person that's ever born goes through the same exact cycle. They grow up in sin, loving the things of the world, trying to live through those things in the world apart from the God that created them and gave them to them and loves them. But here's the thing about it, the crazy thing about it, is if you're the person that pursues those things, if you're the person that just wants the money, you want the fame. You want people to recognize you. You want your name and lights. You want placards all over the place so people can see what you've done. Then you may get those things in this world. But I can promise you one thing. Those things apart from Christ will not satisfy you. They will not satisfy you. There's nothing that you can do. There's no amount of money that you can earn. You can't help enough people cross the street, rake their yard, cut trees up to be satisfied apart from Christ. He's the only one that can do it. You say, Pastor, I don't get this. Well, he's told us on several occasions that he is the peace that passes all understanding. Listen, if you're dissatisfied, you're anxious in this world, you need a peace. The only one you can get it through is Jesus. He's the only one that you can get it through. And the big picture of this story culminated in the oldest son. The oldest son was the ones that originally asked the question at the beginning of chapter 15. They're like, why are you talking to these tax collectors and sinners? What's the point? Why are you doing that? And Jesus said, I find joy when they come to me. I find joy when they find repentance. That was his answer. And yet he's still pleading with the tax collectors. He's still pleading with the religious leaders there during that day to come to him for salvation. If today you've been sitting in here and you said, I don't know Jesus, I have not been living for Jesus, then he has given a very simple formula. He said, repent, turn from your sins. Put your faith and trust in him alone. Follow him for the rest of your life. And you have eternal life. Those who see their sin for what it really is, those who see it for its wickedness, will turn to Christ. And when you ask, will you save me? He absolutely will. He absolutely will. Are you dissatisfied? You have to ask yourself, why in this world has that continued to happen? Folks, I give you the opportunity each week, but if you need to talk to me about having a saving relationship with Jesus or furthering in that, understanding that more, I want to talk to you about it. If your person in here says, I know Jesus, but I was never baptized, here's the order. Come to faith in Jesus, amen? Come to faith in Jesus. This is on the back of your insert. And then be baptized. Well, Pastor, what if I was baptized? And then I came to faith in Jesus. Well, it's your choice, okay? I'd like to talk to you about believer's baptism. We get baptized here because it's a testimony to who Christ is and what he's done in our life. If you were baptized as a child, you never gave that testimony because you didn't know who he was, okay? It's not us beating up on you or somebody else for teaching you something different. We're just following a biblical order. Pastor, you need to be able to show it to me. Go back and read Acts chapter 2. and You'll see it there. You can read the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and see the very same thing. I know I've gone on this morning, but I can't get to the end of this story without fleshing it out the way that it needed to be. And I hope you'll respond as the Lord leads you as he works on your heart today. Please stand.
Father, I thank you so much for letting us come together today as your church. And Father, for those that aren't a part of it that have gathered alongside your church, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work in conviction and bring them into a saving knowledge of you. Father, that they would yield their life to you. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you've blessed us with. I ask that you be with us in the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name, 